Thanks, Viv, and uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, yeah, thanks to Sandy and Claire for pretty kind words. Uh, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about, about Noosa, and Noosa basically is still having a love affair with, with solar. 50% uh, of, of houses in Noosa now have solar. We're up to now 83 megawatts of solar on roofs uh, since the start of the installation process. So uh, that's, that's equivalent to quite a significant solar farm. They say like the Sunshine Coast Council solar farm is 15, uh, 15 megawatts. So that's roughly five times that on Noosa roofs. So there's increasing, with that, there's increasing exports. For those that have solar, you watch your solar e export amounts. I mean, unfortunately, uh, the, the feed-in tariffs are, are reducing. But that's really a reason, the reason behind that is that there is so much. And when market forces start to work, uh, when you've got an excess there, you know, the prices are going to be, going to be reduced. So as an example of how much solar, and that, that graph shows shows the steep climb and that's still <coughs> continuing. Uh, I checked yesterday and over the last 12 months another 10 megawatts of solar on rooftops was added in the Noosa Shire over the last 12 months. So it's pretty incredible and so that curve just continues to, to drive up. Uh, if you look to see the effect of that amount of solar, particularly in the hinterland, there's a what's called a zone substation is where the where the very high voltage comes into the Noosa area. So the Coran zone substation is just near Pomona, Louis Bazo Drive. So we can see what the catchment area is there. And looking at the, the data that Energex publishes on whatever it is, over 260 days of the year, there are times during the day when there's more solar being generated in that whole catchment area for that zone substation than, than people are using. So, and those number of days, like if you go back about four years ago, maybe it was about 20 days, but that's just climbing up. So I expect when they publish the data for this year, it'll be even higher than that 260. So it just shows, shows Noosa is awash with excess solar. And so I guess what this project is about is recognising that and seeing if we can capture that, all that wonderful you know, renewable energy which is generated, and then to be able to use it in periods when, to coin a phrase, when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. Viv, <laughs> the duck. <laughs> Jim lets me do this one because he knows I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you can see this uh, diagram. It's it's a diagram of the performance of a particular substation, um, the North McLean Zone substation. It's giving you electricity consumption over, actually it's now a 12 year period, from September 2010 to September 22. The different coloured lines are for each of the years. Um, they call it a duck curve. I think someone with a really uh, outrageous imagination managed to call it that. Um, but across this bottom line is a 24 hour day consumption pattern. So in the early hours of the morning, our consumption is staying pretty well unchanged. Um, your 10 years are compressed in there. That's when people are getting up, switching on the light, boiling the kettle, um, getting ready for the day. Then all that solar that Jeff was talking about starts to kick in. And, and this, is, this is a really, I think, massive display of the change that's happened over 12 years. So at the top there is your 2010 line. Down here is your 2022 line, where it's absolutely going into uh, producing more solar than we're using. So that solar is going back into the grid. Um, my, my technical experts here will stand by to answer questions about the problems that that can create for the electricity grid in terms of the overall stability. 
Um, and you may have heard of something called the solar tax, which was being dreamed up to try and, and deal with that. So then the sun goes down, the solar's not pumping. Up we come into this electricity consumption. So currently, that's still coal-fired power. So while we're doing as much as we can with solar, and that's a, a, it's an absolutely terrific initiative, now people have said, well, the next stage of the process has to be, how do we collect this and reuse it here? Storage, as Sandy said. Storage, storage, and more storage. So that's the duck curve, handing back over to Jeff now. Yeah, so just to reiterate, all those opportunities, you, you may have heard with the Queensland Energy and Jobs Plan for a big, two big pump hydro systems. There's one, uh, the, their advanced feasibility stage just west of Imble at Barumba Dam. So that's a gigantic system there. And there's also an even bigger one planned west of Mackay. Um, so there's those. You've probably heard Sandy mentioned about the state government's rolling out some, some large batteries at those zone substations and so on. I think they're up to about six or seven at the moment. So they're in the megawatt range size. Uh, there's lots of people starting to put batteries on their own premises. I know Mark's got one. Uh, the figures the figures are, are released by uh, by the regulator, which show the amount of home batteries there are, and that that's gradually increasing. I think there's about when I last looked, there's probably three or four megawatts of of batteries installed in people's premises at the moment. I know Steve's got recently done one in his home as well. There's also other things which are happening because what what happens if you look at that duck curve when you've got all this excess electricity during the day? It makes sense to try to use it when it's available and when it's cheap. And so what a lot of people are doing is they're shifting their hot water service to run during the day, particularly if they've got solar on their roofs, because that's the time when you've got all this excess generation, the energy is cheap, so use it. And in fact, your hot water service is a good example of a battery. Um, electric vehicles are also coming, and they're basically batteries on wheels. And so other things where you kind of have your, have your consumption following when the generation is there. So, you know, for instance, if you want to use your dishwasher, well, turn it on. You know, so a simple thing is to say, you know, my wife asked me, when can I turn the dishwasher on? And I said, well, if the sun's shining, turn it on. Quite simple. But we see with all those different things there, we also see there's a role for local or community or neighbourhood batteries because not everybody's going to be able to afford to put in a, in a battery in their own premises. Not everybody at this stage is going to be able to afford an EV, but you all will be driving one one, by, one day. So we see there's another, there's, a, there's, a, there's another local method of doing it and we see by combining our resources, uh, we can do it as a community uh, because if you can do things together, uh, you don't you, you get much more efficiencies in terms of the money that you spend. So I'll just quickly go over this because basically I think we've covered all of that. We're talking about capturing all that excess solar during the day and releasing it at night. It's about reducing carbon emissions because that's really what we are. Because every kilowatt hour of of uh, consumption you don't take from coal-fired power stations is reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, it's also going to allow more solar on the grid because, as if you look at that curve of Nusa, keep adding 10 megawatts of solar a year that's going to put more and more pressure on the grid and because the grid was basically designed as a one-way grid and not a two-way grid. Energex have done, uh, when you think about it, they've done an extraordinary job in coping with this change in a very short period of time, but it does put pressures on them. Um, it will put downward pressure uh, on energy bills because we can capture that cheap uh, generated electricity during the day and then reuse it at night. That'll put downward pressure. 
and also it'll help support the network in areas where there is a lot of excess solar floating around there. So what I'm just going to do now is we, we've been working with uh, Yarra Energy Foundation has been mentioned. So they're, they're the premier group in Australia that are working with community batteries. And uh, uh, we've been working with Chris Wallen and the team down, down there uh, for about the last two years. They, they, we wouldn't have been able to put in the, the grant with council without them. Um, they've been extraordinary and they've been extraordinarily helpful for us. So I'm just going to see if I can switch. Hello, my name is Chris Wallen. And before I go any further, I'd like to pay my respects to uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land I live and work. I'm the manager of the uh, energy and storage team at Yarra Energy Foundation. We're a not-for-profit. Uh, we've been around for about 13 years, helping communities and councils in solar bulk buys, energy efficiency, and similar projects. In the last three years, we've had a strong focus on community batteries and have worked with uh, the local electricity distributor here, um, we were so lucky to be given the grant by the Victorian government and we worked with uh, many parties to pull off the first inner urban community battery in Australia, uh, which you can see behind me. That happened on World Environment Day, Day last year. It's a system that is operating every day, uh, trading on the electricity market, but most importantly, it's charging during the day and discharging at night which is the decarbonisation goal, the primary goal of this system. Uh, but there is more to come, and we're working on a second system already in Richmond, uh, where we hope to um, be uh, displaying how a community battery works with an EV charger. We're a small team here, and uh, we're in great demand at the moment with so many different projects underway, either in our own name or for others. And we made a, an exception uh, for uh, Zen and Noosa Council uh, to work closely with them. And for a good reason, uh, while we have the chance of working with many parties, we've been impressed by Zen and Noosa Council, uh, their can-do attitude, how well they have organized themselves and well-connected and uh, uh, very uh, clear on their goals. And um, I think a goal congruence with what we are doing. So it was very easy to engage. And uh, I'm impressed because it's not an easy area. I mean, community batteries is uh, both about technical, financial, commercial, social issues. There's quite a lot to take care of. And again, it promises a lot. So it is definitely worthwhile, but it takes effort. And uh, the Zen team and the Nusa Council team have really come through um, in a way I haven't seen elsewhere. So really, kudos uh, to the, the the combined team. Uh, I think uh, what I wanted to uh, emphasize is um, we worked uh, maybe for the last two years together, um, and we have shared values in that we really are looking after community benefits first and foremost while tackling climate change. And I can see that we could be very successful going forward. I'm looking forward to working with Zen and Nusa Council in the coming years and delivering many projects. So uh, I think you are in great hands. With that, thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk to you. And I hope to be able to connect with you um, in the future. There's another one from Marnie Shaw, who is uh, a uh, researcher from the Australian National University, so they're they're the premier, they're the premier um, uh, university that are doing research in the community batteries. So I'll just uh, let Marnie say a few words. Hello, everyone. My name is Marnie Shaw, and I'm a researcher in the battery storage and grid integration program at the Australian National University, and I'm speaking to you today from the Ngunnawal lands in Canberra. So over the past five years, our research program has been conducting technical and social research into community batteries. 
And what we've heard very loud and clear is huge enthusiasm for community batteries, both from everyday householders like you and I, and also from the energy industry more broadly. And now we see that government has recognised this enthusiasm and we heard last year the announcement of several new large funding programs to support the rollout of this new technology. So why this interest in community batteries? There's a good promise that this type of battery storage could be a more efficient way and more convenient way to deliver storage to our suburbs. We know that people want more solar on their rooftops, they want cheaper energy bills, they want rapid decarbonisation, but they also like the idea of keeping energy local and having a community level contribution to a shared project. A big challenge in the rollout of community batteries is ensuring that these values that people are hoping for are actually delivered in community battery projects. So groups like Yarra Energy Foundation and Zero Emissions Noosa, who recognise that community is front and centre of these projects, are so important. They know it's about making sure that local communities are really involved in the design and implementation of renewable energy systems. So thank you so much for coming along to this forum and thank you for your support of community groups like Zero Emissions Noosa. We know that community is key and together we can create a more sustainable and equitable future for everyone. Thank you. Just a, a quick diagram on, on how it works. So we've got two houses with solar, for instance. So they, when the sun's shining, they'll, they'll be pushing energy out onto the grid, down this, the line down their street. Uh, people that don't have solar, I don't know whether people actually know about this, but excess solar from your system, if your neighbor doesn't have solar, uh, they will be using your solar when it's exported. So solar goes out, exported, uh, is picked up by the, by the blue house with the red roof, uh, and any excess then is then soaked up by the community battery during the day. So then night time comes, the battery's charged during the day, so it starts releasing energy as these houses here uh, start consuming electricity. So whether they've got solar or whether they've got no solar, they will all benefit from, from that uh, solar energy which has been stored in the battery during the, the sunny hours for them to use at night. So it's a fairly simple concept. So um, we've heard about the Australian Government Grant and we're incredibly um, uh, thankful for, for the, the uh, partnership we've had with Yarra Energy Foundation, but it wouldn't have happened without Annie Nolan down the back there, who poked and prodded people in the executive team and other people in council, uh, held workshops with the, the councillors and so on to bring them all on board. And I was, I was really thankful that I could be at the, the meeting to present to the councillors when they were making the decision Will we, will we step out of the rubbish and roads arena and then move back into the electricity uh, arena? And so there was unanimous support uh, from all of the people in that room, all of the councillors and all the exec team. So it was, a, it was a wonderful, wonderful day. So just a picture here, that's of Chris Bowen here uh, when he came up and made a pre-election announcement to say there will be a community uh, battery in Nooseville. So he came good on that promise with the release of the, of the grant funding uh, guidelines just, uh, well, it was about four days before Christmas. Uh, so there was 58 locations uh, altogether that were announced. 13 of those were in Queensland and uh, we got the grant application in one day before it was due. So just quickly about how we selected a site, uh, we were told that it had to be in Nooseville. It had to be in basically the postcode area of Nooseville 4566. And so, so, so what we did, as we said, 
okay, this is, going, this is a community battery program for households, and so we'll look for residential areas. And so we just quickly looked around and he said, so we said, well, any of the commercial or industrial areas, we won't consider those. Uh, we said, because we didn't have very much time, we said we won't consider any of the tourist strips down Gympie Terrace and so on. And, and we also decided that we'd try to choose typical areas and not the, um, uh, not the more salubrious uh, areas. So we also tried to find areas, uh, residential areas, which had a lot of solar, and there were a lot of them. Uh, I've just shown one here, which is McGregor Park, uh, uh, off Beckman's Road, uh, near Nooseville State School and St. Teresa's School. So um, what we had to do is to try to find an area of, of houses that were connected to a, to a local distribution transformer. And so the, the black arrow there points to, to where the, if, you're, if you can see there's a little spark right here which shows where the distribution transformer is. And all those dots you see there, they're all the houses that are connected by the, the low voltage network and it's underground there, uh, they're all the houses that connect to that transformer. So the 74 houses in that area, uh, almost 70% of them have solar and uh, Viv over here, she counted the panels on all the roof when we used, uh, we used NearMap to do that and so we calculated conservatively there's about 370 kilowatts of solar installed on those 74 houses. So we said, that's a pretty good area. There's a lot, lot of solar, so therefore there'll be a lot of excess uh, uh, generation during the day, which isn't used, which will be exported. We had to find somewhere which, was, which had some suitable land close by. And seeing we're going in, in this with, with council, we thought a local park might be, a, or local council land might be an area. Um, and we had to meet a whole lot of other uh, criteria as well. You know, visually how would it look because you don't want to sort of stick it because it's going to be four of those things over there so you know, when I first saw it I thought gee that's big but I guess you know when it's when it's placed suitably yeah look there's different things we can do and I've had discussions with council about how we can uh, make it the visual amenity okay we need to consider noise these things have air conditioners so uh, th that's, they're, they're not too noisy. I think it's, it's 62. There's one with 62 decibels. Mm -hmm. um, when they do run, they don't run all the time. So you just need to make sure that you place those so you're not going to like place those facing somebody's window, for instance. So we think we found a good place there. Um, there's a whole lot of other things too. You've got to look at the flood maps and you've got to look at the bushfire, all the other, all the other sort of things. We did a, a pretty extensive site selection report, report uh, based on work that our yeah, Energy Foundation and others have been done, and uh, yeah, that's one of the things we'll talk about in the last session. Uh, Viv, we gauge the community because uh, you can't just come along and say, boy, we got a deal for you, we're going to put a community battery in your park. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so for the, for the two sites that we um, narrowed it down to for the federal government grant, uh, we looked at, yes, all the factors that Jeff said, uh, but recognised that it was, this is, this is new, <coughs> new stuff. Um, and in Noosa, we're pretty protective of what happens in our neighbourhood. I don't know about yours, but mine are. Um, so we knew that we needed to engage very genuinely, very directly with those local communities. We also knew we didn't have a whole heap of time. Uh, so we were lucky, we drew on um, the Zen volunteers, they put their hand up to say, yes, we will door knock every house in those two neighbourhoods. Uh, and if someone is home, we will tell them about the battery, we will provide them with a brochure that outlines uh, the key points about what's involved, we will give them a phone contact, an email contact, we will have frequently asked questions on our, our website. 
So we were, uh, you know, thanks so much to those Zen volunteers. Um, anyone who's done election door knocking knows it's a pretty thankless task. Uh, but uh, we've got a lot of good feedback from people. And at the same time, we organised two sessions, uh, well, one session in each area in the local park where we were thinking about them as potential um, uh, uh, locations for the community batteries. So we uh, set up from 9 to 11. We took our marquee along and all our toys. And this is Barrel, in case you've, we've named it. It started off as Barry the Battery, um, although, but I insisted on some gender equality. So we moved from Barry to Barrel to Barrel. So, uh, and uh, so we really wanted to be able to engage with the community. We, they, they came along, they asked the questions. We had an, uh, a survey on our website, which we asked people to complete as well. So, uh, it, for, and, and we will need to replicate that process wherever we are thinking of putting a community battery in. This is, this is new technology. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just an ethical approach to work closely with your community. What we are proposing if we are successful with the federal government grant is that we would look for representatives from that community to form a community reference group. They would be with us on the journey from beginning to call for um, expressions of interest or tenders for the battery, the criteria for that battery, the final location, all of those questions along the way. So uh, we think it's really important to take that ethical approach right from, from the beginning to say we will genuinely and transparently work with the local community. So, yep, I think that covers it. Thanks, Viv. Um, and uh, So, uh, importantly, it's obvious that this community battery needs to connect to the Energex network. And so, Energex, and uh, if you've got any more detailed questions at the Q&A session, I'm sure Steve will be able to answer those. But Steve was incredible in helping us guide us through the, through the process. Uh, we, we'd, spent, we'd spent quite a lot of time engaging with Energex uh, over the period, and again, Many thanks to Steve for the introduction he gave, and I guess he also, in his own his own networking way, um, told the Energex folks that he still keeps in touch with that uh, there's a group in Noosa that they seem to know what they're doing, they seem to be committed, and there's a council as well that are very committed as well. So uh, I think we've built up that credibility with Energex, but what we needed to do, we need to submit what was called a preliminary connection inquiry because part of the grant process was, was to say, you must have a letter from your local energy network provider, in other words, Energex, uh, to say that they support your application for a community battery in the nominated location. So, so we are very, very pleased that we received a letter of support from uh, the general manager of, of storage uh, for, for Energy Queensland slash Energex to say, yep, they support um, our, our application. <coughs> so, as uh, has been, as Viv alluded to as well, um, uh, and also what, what Claire and Sandy said about the $200 million of uh, federal government money which has been committed to this, the first round we, we went for for those 58 batteries throughout Australia. But the bulk of the of the monies will be administered by a group called Arena, which is the Australian Renewable Energy um, Agency. Agency. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to think about what the end was. Yeah. So, so they they will be administering the program for the remainder of the batteries. Uh, they haven't said exactly when that will be released, but their website does say late March to early April. We hope they kind of say maybe late April or early May because we need to get prepared for this because we need to, to find other locations where um, 
there's going to be community support for a battery in your particular area so we can do a submission for that. So additional money is coming, so we want to be ready for that as well for when that, when that lands. Now we think we're in good shape because we've done all the work that was required to get, to get the application in for the community battery in Nooseville and we feel as if we've got the ways of selecting a site and the processes there. We feel as if we've had experience with how to engage with a local community. So uh, we feel in good shape there, uh, but you know there's still still work to be done. So things we'll need to be doing is we'll need to be finding suitable sites, and that's part of today is to say this is what this is the opportunities are here. And so if there are people, and we know that when we went to Karoi, there were, there were many people that came up and said, yeah, look, I'm really interested in one in my particular area. So I'm hoping that the same thing will happen here on the coast with a larger population uh, to, to see how we go. And I know there's already, there's already about three groups of people in, the, uh, in the, uh, the coastal areas that are interested in doing it. Uh, with that, community engagement will need to come as well. And also, well, we need to be looking for uh, other partners as well. As part of the council procurement policy, is that, is that uh, with the grant application that we put in, is that we'll be going with Yarra Energy Foundation for that, but through the other policies and things like that. We want to see who else, who else can deliver these as well. So both uh, Claire and Sandy mentioned as well, be fantastic if we get our first community battery uh, installed here in Nooseville. Uh, but we're all about carbon reduction. Uh, when I first started looking at this community, because I, I do the graphs and the numbers and stuff like that, so I looked at that and said, okay, put in one community battery, uh, 360 megawatt hour, 360 kilowatt hours, work out how much, um, uh, how much energy you can time shift by capturing it during the day and, and, and then uh, releasing it at night and work out what that does in terms of savings of tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, by not using coal-fired power stations at night. Um, so when I looked at those numbers I said, oh, well is this going to have any deep measurable effect we need to have lots and lots of these. We basically need have storage, storage, and more storage, as Sandy said. <coughs> so, so that was the idea, is to say, we don't know how exactly how we're going to do it, but we said we need to be aiming at that. And one of the reasons why we partnered with Yarra Energy Foundation was when I first heard Chris Wallen speak, he talked about, in, in their area, in the Yarra Council area in uh, inner city Melbourne, he said their aim was to have 200 batteries within their region over the next seven years. So I thought, wow, yeah, you're a not-for-profit, you've got very similar goals to us, and you actually understand that, that it's a big job here and we need to set our, our goals high rather than just put in one community battery, pat ourselves up on the back and say, well done, and that's it. Because we need to, we need to really you know, be shifting, uh, <coughs> shifting the, the generation to, to night so we take advantage of all that excess solar we have. Uh, so what we're doing today is part of the roadmap project, which is we're very grateful for, uh, for the state government, uh, Department of uh, Environment and Science for the grant that we have to do this work. And part of today is doing the community engagement, getting your feedback. We've got a survey which we'd like to ask you and your friends to fill out so we can get a good measure about what the community sentiment is of, of these, these proposals. Um, we feel now that we've got that first application in. When we were, before that actually came in, Viv and I was, as she said, we were going along at a, you know, at a good pace and so on. Uh, but a lot of it was theoretical. But when we said, when, when we were told, well, there's this application to, for, a new, for a community battery in Nooseville, 
that's where the rubber really hits the road. And I guess that's one thing that Steve has always said to us, you've got you to get in the rubber hitting the road. So we feel as if we know how, how to do it now, and we feel like we know a lot of things about how to select a suitable location. We've got connections with Energex now, so we feel like you know, we're, we're ready. Uh, the last dot point there is that one of the other things will be we, we haven't really done too much work on yet, but we know that we do, do need to is, to, is to try to look at the alternate business models because it's fine to say, you know, we'll get, we'll get one battery in with, with grant funding and we might get another one, two or three from the next rounds of, of funding. Uh, but we need to look beyond that because that's about all that we would really get. So we need to be looking at the business models about how can we sustainably do that. In other words, preparing very fertile ground for, for investors when they're looking to take advantage of this because the smart money will say what's the future they can see storage is the future so we want Noosa to be an area where uh, people can, can look at and say look it's got really strong council support for this they've already applied for one and then maybe they might apply for others uh, it's got a really strong community support for it and so it would be a natural choice then for people if they've if they want to open their wallets to invest in these things to say, yeah, Noosa looks a pretty damn fine place to invest.